Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the 12th of 19 candidate forums for the 2021 general elections here in the Cayman Islands, being hosted by the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce in association with Fosters. My name is Mike Gibbs, and I have the honor of being the current president of the Chamber of Commerce. I will also be one of the panelists asking the questions this evening, along with Ms. Joanne Lawson, Secretary of the Chamber. I'd like to begin my opening comments by welcoming each of the West Bay North candidates, Rolston Anglin and Bernie Bush, and thanking them for accepting the Chamber's invitation to participate in this forum. Your willingness to appear on the same platform demonstrates to voters that you take the democratic process seriously and are ready to respond to a series of questions on the top issues as identified by a recent online Chamber survey. More than 400 responses and more than 200 questions have been submitted via the survey, and these will help to frame the questions for this evening's forum. There is certainly not enough time to ask all the questions, but we will do our best to cover the topics that have been identified as the most important to the Cayman Islands and the West Bay North constituency. When the Chamber was formed in 1965, the goal was to create an organization that supports, promotes, and protects the interests and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since the 1988 election. So for nine elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to hear from their candidates and educate themselves before election day. These forums have taken weeks of planning and preparation, with all the credit going to the hardworking chamber staff but would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, Fosters, Affinity Recruitment, Bodens Legal and Corporate, and Dart. So a very big thank you to them. I would also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to our media partners, Cayman Mile Road, Cayman Life TV, Radio Cayman, Government Information Services, and ICCI FM for agreeing to broadcast tonight's forum. It is the first time that we have live stream the forums on the internet, and we hope that this new format will enable even more people to watch them in the comfort of their home. It is now, not, <coughs> sorry, it is now time to begin this evening's forum. I will therefore turn the proceedings over to Mr. Will Pinot, CEO of the Chamber, who will serve as this evening's moderator. He will explain the rules and, enter, and introduce the West Bay North candidates. Good evening, candidates. Rules for tonight's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions, and you'll have two minutes to answer if you choose to do so. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption, and is free to differ with an opinion or position of another candidate during your allotted response time. We're asking you to deal solely with the issues, and at the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allowed two and a half minutes to deliver a closing statement. I'll now introduce the candidates for the West Bay North constituency. We begin with Mr. Bernie Bush. Mr. Bush has a sports science degree from Carnegie, which is part of Leeds University. He spent seven years at air traffic control. He took a major pay cut to join the late Winston Skinner to start to build the sports office. He managed KFC for a year in 1987, but left for school in the United Kingdom. After leaving, the sports office in 2000. He was the operations manager for the Cayman Imports in Hurley's. He then went on to manage and turn around the Texaco Express Blue business. He went on then to become the director of Pirates Week Festival, which had become stagnant in the view of many. He brought it back for it and, because, and became for to it to become the biggest yearly event, working with international entities such as Red Bull, NASA, and the Gasparilla. Pirate. Mr. Bush was the former president of the Athletic Association, which was de deep in debt with many problems. When he moved on, he had seen to having over 12 athletes go off on youth scholarships. He was the president of the West Bay Primary School PTA for eight years and founded the Primary School Girls Football Competition. Mr. Bush was also the architect and manager of the under-17 junior girls football team that to this day was rated by FIFA higher than any other Cayman team, male or female. Mr. Bush was also one of the founding members of Special Olympics. 
Good evening. Mr. Ralston Anglin attended the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School, Cayman Islands Middle School, and graduated from the Cayman Islands High School and Sixth Form. He then earned a scholarship from Price Waterhouse Coopers, formerly Price Waterhouse, and graduated with honors from the Ohio State University. He worked in the PWC Cayman Islands and New York offices from 1995 to 2000, principally on hedge fund, mutual fund, banking, trust, trust company, and captive insurance audit engagements. In April 2000, he resigned from DPWC and ran for elected office. He was successful in three general elections and served with distinction as a member of the Legislative Assembly, now Parliament, from 2000 until 2013. From 2000 to 2005, he was a government backbencher, and from 2005 to 2009, he was a member of the opposition, and from 2009 to 2013, as a minister in cabinet and deputy premier of the Cayman Islands. During his tenure in the Legislative Assembly, Mr. Anglin was also the key spokesperson on finance, financial services, education, commerce, and immigration matters. Mr. Anglin, JP, founded the Pointer Consulting Limited in January 2014, a boutique, a boutique consultancy practice focusing on the provision of regulatory and governmental consulting, outsourced accounting, and controller, audit liaison, and internal director, and non-executive director <laughs> services. Welcome, candidates. When we return from this short commercial break, we begin our questioning. Please stay tuned. Behind everything you do. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for West Bay North. I now turn it over to President of the Chamber, Mike Gibbs, to be begin the questioning. Thank you, Will, and again, good evening, candidates. Uh, the first question I will address to Mr. Bush uh, focuses on why have you decided to run in this year's election, and what qualities do you possess that makes you the candidate of choice for West Bay North? I decided to run for the seat once again because I see change coming and this time I will not be on the opposition side where you can where it's difficult to get things done and what makes me what qualities do I possess I've been in my community for over 40 years and I'm a well-rounded individual having uh, worked air traffic control manage the fast food place, work with the Hurley's group of companies. But most of all, I love my people. I care for my people. I love my district. I love my country and I care for them. This alone will let you know that I'm not going to sit by and see things happen to our people and say nothing or do nothing. And with what is coming down the road, after going through this COVID, the suffocation that has set upon us, we need people who are going to be able to make tough decisions. But at all times, we must put the Caymanians first. We have become uh, third-class citizens in our own country, and the Caymanians are feeling the pinch more than anyone else. And I do feel that with me being involved with Pirates Week, youth and sports, the PTA, Special Olympics, Olympics, 
this has given me a broad scope across the community. And I do feel that uh, the connections that I have, both local and overseas, will allow me to get the things that I want done to be able to help our people. Not this time, our people need help. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question, please. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I decided to run after looking very carefully where the, where the Cayman Islands was, but most importantly, looking at the level of representation that I perceived the country was receiving. I believe that within all of us, every candidate, there is no candidate that doesn't love Cayman, that there is no candidate that does not care about our people. None of us have a monopoly on that. Every single one of us do. Every single one of us have put ourselves forward, which is very brave of us. However, when I looked at where Cayman was and where Cayman needs to get to, needs to get to for not just this generation, but for future generations, I saw a lack of talent, a lack of vision in order to get us there. It is great to dream, but how do we ensure those dreams become a reality? When I looked at my 12 years of distinctive service and looked at the achievements we made in those 12 years, but in particular in my last four years as minister in cabinet, with the reform agenda that we were able to execute in public education and sadly not followed through for the last eight years, I saw a need to ensure that we put Cayman, Caymanians most important, on a pathway to success. I believe I bring to the table not only the experience needed locally, but experience overseas to ensure that we can continue to build an economy that serves our people. Cayman is for Caymanians. No one should be ever be ashamed of saying that. That is very, very simple for me, where my life and my heart is at. And going forward, we have to ensure that we elect people who are able to deliver on our promises, but more importantly, solve very complex problems, but not only working with whoever is elected locally, but ensuring that when we go overseas, in particular to the United Kingdom, to London, to New York, and other places that we do a lot of business, we are able to represent Cayman and build Cayman and allow us to achieve our maximum potential. Thank you, Mr. Anglin. Thank you. This question is specifically related to West Bay North constituency, and I'll start with Mr. Anglin. What do you consider to be the main issues impacting residents of West Bay North, and how will you address these issues? The main issues that I've seen addressing residents of West Bay North have been employment and high level of unemployment, senior citizens who have been left behind, left to live in deplorable, deplorable conditions. Ensuring that we have small infrastructure improvements that are so critically needed and ensuring that piece of our environment that resides in West Bay North is protected for future generations. Let me first start with employment. One of the first things that I'm going to do is establish a model district constituency advisory council. And that body, which I'll speak about in another forum, is going to be able to serve the public as it hasn't been served before. One single MLA MP can't do it all. We have to ensure that we put in place the structures, local structures in each constituency that are able to reach people and impact their lives. We have to reform the NAU. Seniors are left behind. Seniors complain all the time about going to NAU to try and receive services, and younger adults are getting the attention that they think they deserve. Housing is a, is a crisis nationally, and so when I look and I go around West Bay North and I see people living in moldy conditions, I cannot have help but have my heart break and ensure I do something to help our residents who are doing that. Small infrastructure needs. We have a park 
in West Bay North. Dilapidated, no electricity, no water. And it needs to improve for our children. And we need to build our network of parks throughout our communities. There are four public open spaces available to do just that. And I'm going to deliver on that promise. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bush, same question. The main issues that I've seen around the district that concern West Bay North, the poverty level, homes, and their property, and the hater barkers, which is a major problem to a lot of people, especially in the West Bay North area of Powery Road. But the, there is no doubt that a lot of people are living a life where you go to their homes. When I'm dropping children home, you talk to parents and they're telling you they're having to choose between paying electricity bill or feeding their children. They're having to choose between electricity or water. When you see these type of things, it really hurts you. You do what you can do, but there are so many, you can only help so much. That is why the next government will address, address these issues immediately. Homes and property. When you talk to young people, their dream, our dream was to own a home. These young people's dream is to own a, a property first so that maybe later they can go with a home. It's become almost a dream that they don't see happening. The head of Barkas is very serious. We have a development once again want to do us what they did on the Seven Mile Beach, where the lo last little local piece where the local people can go, go with their grandchildren, go up there and camp out, go fishing. And some people are taking this very, very serious. And going around and talking, I was surprised at how many people said to me, this is an issue you must address. The environment we must take care of. Over, they're overdoing it, and we're affecting our environment in ways that are not good. So these are issues that have to be addressed and addressed immediately. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next question, uh, which will be addressed to, uh, to Mr. Bush, uh, first is more focusing on national issues. So apart from the reopening of our borders, what are the top two national issues that you intend to raise with the new government and hope to achieve during the next four years, if elected? Things that have to be addressed immediately. Everything has shown that the main concern for people is the cost of living. Another major problem is health care. And of course, it's taken that we have to look at education. But the cost of living... People cannot afford the very essentials that they need, everyday essentials. How do we go at this? Some people have said price control. You have to be careful in those aspects. But we do know that we can go with customs duty. When you're paying, you're paying no duty on things like crystal, binoculars, 7% on watches and so forth, but yet you're paying 22% on baby food, pampers, sanitary napkins, all these very essentials. So what we have to do is to waive the duty on these and work with the people that sell them to say, you cannot mark up on these. We have to find a middle ground. This is one of the ways that we can help our people. Another way is the bond market. We have to bring back some of our pension money, put it into bond markets where we can have low interest so people can start to afford to own a piece of land, own a home. Uh, the pension is losing money overseas, most of them. When you bring that back home and you have the type of market, it's guaranteed you'll make your money. That, so we won't have to uh, sit down and worry about someone is getting paid to lose their money. It won't happen. The, uh, there ain't no doubt that when you bring lower interest and longer term, someone can say, well, I can get a loan for 40 years. And if something happens, my children can take it over. So this is just some of the ways that we have looked at. And there's a few other things we have to look at as well, but time does not permit that, that we have to get the cost of living down. It is imperative, and we have to do it quickly. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question, please. I certainly wish there were just two issues to face this country for the next government. 
there can be no two top priorities. But what I can say is, is that firstly, we have to move swiftly on housing. I have proposed a housing equity credit program where government would bid out incentive packages for 100% owned Caymanian developers. And it has to be medium to small developers where government waives all fees in exchange for direct equity for first time Caymanian homeowners. We would cap that at 100,000. Any other Caymanian who wants to participate can participate at a percentage of that program. Home ownership builds strong communities. We must address the housing crisis in our country. As it relates to families, we can ensure that families are able to better afford to live in this country, principally by ensuring that we have the adequate training opportunities to upskill our people, to ensure that the wages they earn, the wages they earn, allow them to live in this Cayman Islands and rebuild what has been decimated over decades. And this is no single government's fault. Our mid mid middle class has been decimated. This has been a phenomenon in many other countries, but we have to ensure that we work diligently, diligently at it. We have to ensure also that we put in place a credit program for mothers. I believe that we should bring down the cost of ensuring that families can raise their children. I personally believe that we have to be careful about Judy waivers. We have to put money back in Caymanians' pockets. Many other countries do this. It's seamless. You don't have to build a bu huge bureaucracy and you don't have to rely on the honesty of vendors to pass on any Judy waivers to the public. Last but by no means least, the healthcare crisis in this country has got to be addressed and we have to stop paying political lip service to it. Thank and you. one of the ways to do that is to ensure, ensure the NADU does a better job at getting our seniors and most vulnerable insured. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, we'll start with you again. Higher education is the topic of this question. What is your vision for higher education in the Cayman Islands? What roles do you do UCCI, ICCI, and other institutions play in your future vision for higher learning? And would you support merging UCCI, ICCI, and the Cayman Islands Law School to consolidate facilities and resources? Higher learning is, is something that we should be proud of in Cayman. When I went to university and when I lived in New York, most countries were shocked that the Cayman Islands had a national scholarship program, a program where all persons are set a criteria to meet, and if they meet it, they get a scholarship. That is critically important as we continue to build Cayman. What's even more important is ensuring that the database that I started and was discontinued in 2013, where every employer in this country were, ma were going to be mandated to have to participate and ensure that they knew the names, faces, and GPA of every Caymanian who was on scholarship to ensure that we could connect Caymanians with jobs before they came back. We can talk about higher education all we want. We're going to soon suffer a brain drain in this country if we don't grab the bull by the horns now and work closely with the private sector to make sure this happens. As it relates to consolidating resources, I wouldn't support that for one very simple reason. I think every one of these institutions have a role to play in our community. Education is not one of those things that you can simply take a one and singular approach. There are many varying forms. Law for adult learners is extremely important. However, we need to ensure that our children coming out of school have extremely high standards. Standards set for them to ensure that globally they are competing with every single one of their peers and our children have the capability to do it. But we have to set those standards. I have I, I can say <laughs> that given the outcomes of those three institutions, each of them have an important role to play going forward. Thank you. Mr. Bush, same question. I do not uh, feel that we should make any move in the education field until we get all, uh, inf all the information and analysis compiled together. Education is not something to make mistakes on. We've already made some in the past, and we have children that are suffering. 
But yes, higher learning, it must be, we must at all costs let our people get, ex, uh, get access to it. And it should be free. That's another thing. A $20,000 scholarship to a, single mo- a child going to a single mother is almost impossible for that individual to find the rest of that balance to a top university. Uh, each one of those uh, institutions have their place, uh, their place to be, and we should not try to mix them up. Could it be like other things in this country? When you mix it up, everyone loses what their strength is, because one will overpower the other, or in in that field. But we have to make sure that, uh, for example, A levels. Right now, there are young people who want to do A levels, but they cannot afford exactly uh, are a little bit more than what government is giving them. We have to either put it back in our own schools or make sure that whichever child qualifies, we fund it totally. No parents should have to worry about their child getting A-levels, plain and simple. And uh, we must look carefully and see why everything we have in education is having problems. When you get down to the lower levels, you're finding out it's all about accountability. Maybe at this level, it won't be as obvious as in the lower sectors, but there's a problem with accountability in the schools at the present. So we have to step very carefully before we do anything like this. Do your research and make sure that it's crystal clear what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the question number five, which will be uh, after which we will take a short break, uh, focuses on the cost of living. And uh, Mr. Bush, I will... Uh, ask you this first obviously we've already touched on it already but what proposals would you recommend to the new government to reduce the cost of living and to improve the quality of life for the residents of west bay north community cost of living like i said earlier on we have to look at the essentials i'll repeat it we have to look on the essentials and waive duty we also have to look at minimum wage we also have to look at the bond market to lower interest. And all that is international. That will affect West Bay North. But in West Bay North itself, we have places where we can definitely have a farmer's market, a fish market. We must allow the people in that community. We talk about backyard farming. There's a lot of people who have a little piece of property. And if they're too old to farm it themselves, maybe they can lease it to someone who wants to lease it. But we can also look at raising each individual doing their thing to go out and do farming uh, and selling their produce. Because uh, we have to definitely look at food security. And uh, this is one way that we can help our own craft market. West Bay is big enough to have all of its own. We have the talent in West Bay and West Bay North that they can have all of their craft markets and so forth. So these are just some of the things individually we can do. Things like uh, to help lower, someone even suggested uh, carpooling to work, lower the gas. There's a, a, people have suggested a lot of things, but I think it starts with the government make big decisions and uh, helping our people. Like I said earlier on, we have to look also at the housing situation where young people want to get into their own, people want to own their own homes. All of this, if you get, instead of paying rent, you're paying mortgage. And if you have a long term, you have more money in your pocket to spend. So these are just some of the little things that we can do to help West Bay North. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question. Well, I'll return firstly to my proposal as it relates to housing. As we know, one of the single biggest items for any household is your mortgage payment. Under my program, this will instantly lower mortgage payment for every single Caymanian. And so we would then end this debate around how government concessions should be distributed. I can say that given the strength of Cayman, I would not support any further, any further government incentives on Seven Mile Beach or any high income, high end products. They sell themselves, developers will make the the profit. We have to ensure that we're complete, that government, government is interjecting at the level where we get Caymanians into housing with an equity credit that automatically lowers your monthly payments. Our green initiative, we need to start, stop talking about it. Government needs to invest in green technology, in particular in our districts. 
It is not a far-fetched dream for government to look at every single new home that is coming into West Bay North and across the Cayman Islands have zero import duties on any items that homeowners are bringing in that will make our island greener and lower our cost of living. We know that with solar technology, your COC bill can fall dramatically. And so if government starts to invest in our communities in that way and look at a credit program, especially for our most economically vulnerable, will bring down those costs. Tie that in with my mother's credit and the education credit for every family. That impacts families. That lowers cost of living. Thank you. On to the first five questions. Well done. So, and we're going to take a short commercial break. We come back with the next round of questions. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for West Bay North. I'll now turn it over to Joanne to begin the next round of questions. This question is in relation to District Council. So I'll start with you again, Mr. Anglin. Are you willing to commit to hold quarterly community meetings and establishing a democratically elected District Advisory Council? If yes, would you... Sorry, what would be your intended outcomes of these meetings? If no, please elaborate. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, first, let's break it down into its compo component parts. Firstly, I am a strong advocate to ensuring that we create district advisory councils. However, when you look at the current legislation, it's, in my opinion, woefully inadequate and has a lot of gaps. My proposed District Advisory Council for West Bay North is going to have 17 members, a chairman, a deputy chairman, an assistant secretary who would be non-voting, an employment and commerce subcommittee, a 
Conservation and Infrastructure Subcommittee, an Education and Training Subcommittee, a Community Development Subcommittee, a General Government Services Subcommittee, and each of those would be comprised of three members. Each of the chairs of the various subcommittees would also hold a different post. So, for example, the Employment and Commerce Subcommittee, that the chair of that would be the treasurer. The chair of the Conservation Subcommittee would be the secretary. The Community Development Subcommittee's chair would be the assistant secretary. And the Government Services Subcommittee chair would be the assistant treasurer. The subcommittee, the Advisory District Council's law, as it stands, only calls and allows for 10 members. I don't believe we can get what we need done in our various districts with that limited uh, pool and the way in which it's looked to be constructed. Now, let's be careful with how you, the question has been posed. It says democratically elected. I'm not sure if you want to elaborate, Chamber. Does that mean that you talk about going back to the polls and asking people to elect a district council from the general public? That is the definition of democratically elected, in my opinion. I believe that the District's Advisory Council, um, how it's composed in the legislation, can also be expanded upon. I think that what Thank we you. should do is have members selected by the opposition and the government to ensure there's balance. Thank you. Mr. Bush, same question. Yes. In the first two years of this term, I had quarterly meetings at the town hall. Then I had heart surgery, and that went by the wayside, and then COVID came in. So, But I do think that the way it is written in the law, we have, some people have interpreted to say that the government selects the committee. No. I think it should select amongst the people in that area, in West Bay North or whatever. Right now we have a group in West Bay called the West Bay Action Committee. We have a good foundation there. Get them. You get the other people who are not, who haven't come to that. You have elections. And I, too, felt that it should be divided into sectors. You have a section of that group to identify people that need help in their homes, like maybe have mold, they need a new roof. You have a fundraising section that will go out and deal with nonprofit organizations to get funding. You have a next section that will deal with the government issues. I feel it should be divided into sectors. Uh, limiting to 10, I think, is too small. And I think the government should not be naming the people because if the government uh, is uh, it, that's sitting on the government side is not in the power, the member for that area may not be a member of government. And they could actually undermine the MP for that area by putting their people there. So it has to be where the people elect themselves, whether they support the government or they don't support the government. It has to be democratic, dem uh, democratically done. And that is that everybody gets their say. They divide into groups. The MP should not have a vote, should not have a say. They should be advising the MP on issues that they find. Then we go to try to get the funding to do things that they can't fund themselves. But yes, I do believe in the district councils. I had just gotten the paperwork to try to copy what the member from Northside was doing. So this is something that I do support, and I do hope that uh, as this is in, we can get it started right away. I think it has a big role to play. Thank you. Mr. Bush, uh, staying with you, then for the next question, focuses on ministerial positions. And would you accept a ministerial position in the new government if one was offered to you and if yes, which ministry best suits your skills and qualifications? I do feel that I have the ability to be the minister for uh, sports, youth, culture. And after having worked very closely during the Pirates Week uh, with Shamari, with the uh, Cayman Airways, with the port, I could see myself also doing a very good job of the tourism package. Uh, one of the things that I've proved that I was not typical of everyone else thinking inside the box. You have to think outside the box. You, I show that with Pirates Week. And I'm sure uh, having uh, gone to, uh, been uh, asked to speak at a sports conference in Jamaica about uh, eight or nine months before uh, COVID came in, sitting there with the ESPN executives and the NBC uh, executives, 
I did realize that sports tourism is something that we really have to look at. Serious sports tourism, not uh, uh, just bringing little teams here. Uh, is not, we are in a perfect position uh, for planes. We have, we're not a third world country when it comes to our infrastructure. We have communications. We have everything here to do with uh, that professional teams from in cold countries would love to come here. So I have no problem in saying that I, ha I could see myself doing a very good job with sports, youth, culture, uh, things like social services, which I've been in for the last 40 years, dealing in the area with that, and also tourism. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question. Well, if I'm privileged to be elected by the pe good people of West Bay North in any negotiation, yes, I would um, take up a ministerial position. I have I've seen all three sides of this uh, political equation. I've been a backbench member of the government. I've been an opposition member and I've been a minister in cabinet. The fact of the matter is you can get a lot done in any one of those roles as long as you're willing to work, negotiate, and fight. In fact, during my year, my term in the opposition, we got countless roads and other community projects completed for the District of West Bay. However, getting back to sp the specifics of the question, I would take up a ministerial post. Um, in regards to what post that would be, would depend on the makeup of all of the other persons who would form cabinet. I would feel comfortable in a number of roles. This document is 11 pages of achievements that I achieved as Minister of Education. I am a qualified accountant, so naturally, I would feel very comfortable being Minister of Finance. My background is in financial services. So I'd feel very comfortable being the minister responsible for financial services as well. I do know that with my background in a, as an auditor and a person that believes in bring, building systems, accountability, and bringing structure and discipline to government, the reform of our social network and, and fabric is critically important. And so that would be something that I would, would advocate to also have a very strong voice in, which is reorganizing social services, and the needs assessment unit to ensure we're building stronger communities. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, start with you again. Reopening borders. Tourism is an important pillar of the Cayman Islands economy, with many small tourism-related businesses suffering as a result of the closure of our borders. What are your views about the timeline for reopening the borders to stay over visitors? Reopening of our borders has not only got to be led by the science of our vaccination rates, we know that our infection rate is practically zero, but our vaccination rate needs to, at a minimum in my opinion, be at 80 to 90 percent and have the vast majority of our most vulnerable, i.e. those with underlying conditions, also vaccinated. However, this decision isn't about my opinion. It's about what's happening globally. What is going to be happening in the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, the places we receive the majority of our visitors from, until their vaccination rates are adequately high, i.e. greater than 70 to 80 percent, and until their infection rates are, are, are low, i.e. somewhere south of 10 percent. We cannot even take the chance of entertaining reopening our borders to any such country. And so this really isn't about me. This isn't about any individual that's going to be elected. This is going to be about the science. This is going to be about what's happening globally to ensure that this bubble that we've created remains intact. However, I, I'm, all, I'm cognizant of the fact that we have to help our people and help our people even more. And I, from the very first public meeting I had, announced that as part of any new administration, I think this tourism stipend should be re in increased to $2,000 per recipient. And we need to go on a feverish retraining exercise so that our people are not only upskilled in other areas of our economy, but 
have a fallback plan and an alternative in their life should they choose to use it. Thank you. Mr. Bush? This is not a decision for politicians. This is a decision that's to be made by the medical people. This country should be given its props for the discipline we've shown during this whole pandemic. Other countries also had the chance to listen to the same instructions that we got from the CDC, but they chose to do their own thing, jump on human rights, do all kinds of crazy things. The people of this country must be complimented. They, they remain disciplined and they listen to what the medical people had to say. Kudos to our people for being the way we are. The reopening has to be the, the, med the medical people's decision, and we should just listen and follow them. Very simple. We have to make sure that the countries the people are coming from, that it's on the decline, and their vaccination rate is continuing to climb. We have to make sure that the testing and short-term stay over. Like what I'm trying to say, if you get tested today, you... And you have to wait until that test comes in before you can jump on the plane and travel, or maybe a day or so before. And when you come, you get tested again. So even if people have gotten the vaccine, both shots like we have, we have to ensure that even when they come, they're still tested. We cannot take a chance, like I said before, and let any of this get, uh, get away in our community. We must look about the lives of our people. That's more important than money. We have, at a time like this, if you see your neighbor hurting, we should try to help each other. The government can do a lot, can do a lot more, but we also have to make sure we look out for each other. But this decision, plain and simple, is a medical decision, not a political one. It's not my opinion. It's the opinion of the scientists or the doctors. Thank you. Mr. Bush, uh, with you, staying with you, <clears throat> the Cayman Turtle Center, like many other businesses in the tourism sector, has seen its revenue dramatically reduced due to the closure of our borders to stay over and cruise to, uh, visitors. It is unlikely that the volume of visitors to the centre will return to pre-pandemic levels for some time. What is your view about the future of the centre and what actions would you support if elected? The centre is very important to us, historically, culturally. What we may have to do is to make sure there's a separation between the scientific side and the entertainment side. People have complained about the subsidy that government gives to the turtle farm. We cannot complain about that because it's Caymanians employed there. Right now they're going through a rough time with uh, uh, certain people, but the people there are dedicated. They're good people. What they've done in Hawaii is to also get the high school and their colleges there involved with the tagging and various stuff. I don't think we do enough of that here locally with our schools and the scientific side. And I'm sure knowing Walter and those people down there, they'd be happy for that. On the next side, the entertainment side, we have to make that into a first class entertainment sector where on weekends, you have people lined up to go in. Think outside the box, like once again, get some outstanding water slides, get all kind of things that the people will want to have a birthday party there. People will want to make sure that, oh, I'm going to have a birthday party at the turtle farm. There are many ways to skin this cat, but we must support it. We cannot close it down at this time. We just have to make sure it's run efficiently, but it is and can be a moneymaker. Even private parties can be held there in the evenings down on the beach. It's a it's a multitude of things that that place could be used for. So I have total support for the turtle farm, not closing it, keep it open, it, run it efficient, and let's make it into a really nice place that the local people can maintain it with their presence until the tourist package slowly picks back up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. England, same question. The, the turtle center <laughs> has a lot of potential to be many things in, in Cayman. Um, I know that they have gone down the road of trying varying types of entertainment and has not been as successful as they would have hoped for varying reasons. I think one of the things that needs to happen automatically after the elections 
is firstly, we need to ensure we clearly understand what's happening at the Turtle Center. Um, I know I received an email just last week that apparently 60% of the staff there are pretty much in revolt against a non Caymanian that's employed at the Turtle Center. You're not going to achieve anything when you have staff who are disgruntled, staff who are writing future MPs, complaining about work conditions, and complaining about being subject to discrimination and unfair treatment. However, once we understand what's happening, we have to ensure that we put the necessary leadership, talent, in place to maximize the potential of the Turtle Center. The scientific element in terms of the butchering, the tag and release program is strong and has ran itself pretty much for a number of decades. In fact, I'm proud to say that my father is probably one of the most popular Caymanians because he's the chief butcher and he's been the chief butcher for many years. And so I know a lot of people miss him. Uh, he's not on island right now, but he'll be back, God willing, soon. And he'll be entertaining those customers and hosting them in the near future. However, on the entertainment side, we have to put people in place that can build an entertainment product. We have to be real about this. and We have to be fair and honest about this. If we don't do that, we're going to spin our wheels and continue to subsidize the Turtle Center, start programs that don't work. We have to reorganize and invest in the Turtle Center for it to maximize its potential. Thank you. <clears throat> this is the last question before the break. Mr. Anglin, stay with you on this one. Rest sorry, restricting jobs for Caymanians. Certain jobs, such as condominium managers, are reserved exclusively for Caymanians. If elected, would you support expanding this list to other job categories? If yes, which jobs would you restrict exclusively for Caymanians? I'm proud to say as Minister of Labor that I took a bill to the House that was passed unanimously, unanimously among MLAs at the time, that called for the creation of certain categories of jobs to be, to have quotas. It's the same concept, but it's flipping it on its head slightly to give government and the economy the flexibility it needs. If you allocate a job and say it can only be for Caymanians, what happens when you don't have Caymanians who want or enter that job category? When you have a quota system, what you can do is you can ensure that certain jobs are designated for, for Caymanians, by having a quota of zero. If the quota for work permits is zero, that means the only people that can enter that job market are Caymanians. Condominium managers, absolutely. That used to be the case as long as I was a teenager and as long as I grew up and knew myself in Cayman. I believe that we have to look very carefully and work with organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, our Economic and Statistics Office, and make tough decisions about the labor market in this country. If we don't do it, we're going to continue to have Caymanians marginalized in the labor market. We have to understand it, that the next Minister of Labor has got to be someone who is going to roll up their sleeves and actually be a minister responsible for labor and not just pussyfooting around. This has to be a part of our reform agenda as a country nationally. Thank you. Mr. Bush? Yes. Uh, I remember when it was put down that only Caymanians could be managers for condominiums. That's one of our happiest days. And we had a lot of great Caymanians do a good, great jobs along that Seven Mile Beach. Uh, I think we once we identify which field we are going to go into, we have to make sure we trade carefully because we don't want to affect whatever market it is. But there are things like the North Sound. We have a whole lot of young people in West Bay and in North Side who, because of their proximity to the North Sound, would be happy to hear that, look, I'm guaranteed a job. Okay, you know you have to show up because we have to play our part as well and make sure that we have to show up on time when we have excursions and so forth. There, are, there, we have to sit down with the Chamber of Commerce, with the Labor Office, and say, 
which sector are we going to look at? We just can't just pick them out of the air. And we shouldn't have to do this, but it seems like we're being forced to do it because the work permit is supposed to take care of that, that if you're not, uh, you have Caymanians that are qualified and willing, and they're not getting a shake at these jobs. So if we have to dictate and do it, let's do it. I have no problems in saying, yes, this particular job is for Caymanians only. Australia has done that. Other countries have done it with, uh, just for their indigenous people. But I'm not going to say indigenous people. I'm going to say once you're a Caymanian, you're a Caymanian. But it's only for us. We must do it. We have to do it. And if some people are not happy, that's their problem. I've heard people say it should be also that way in real estate. I've heard many people pick out that field. But once again, we have to make sure we do our research, be careful, work with all parties involved before we say this is what we're going to do. But yes, I agree with that totally. Caymanians only in certain jobs. Thank you. So we've completed the second round of questions. We're going to take a short commercial break. Please stay tuned for the next round of questions after this break.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for West Bay North. Now I'll turn it back over to President Mike Gibbs for the third round of questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bush, this question will be addressed to you first. Focuses on the environment. What do you regard as the highest risk to the Cayman Islands' natural environment, and what measures would you recommend to address this risk? In 2000, the first time it was asked that question, I was the only one who said the dump. The dump, I think they're, they're making an effort to get there, but that's not our main problem right now. We are doing too much constructing. We're doing too much building. And we have to slow it down. We have to try to make sure what impact is having on the environment. Right now, when you look around, the amount of mangrove and these type of things that have been torn up, it is unbelievable what the CPA is thinking about approving these uh, buildings or these things uh, in places where they are, a lot of people can't figure it out, but it's definitely not right. That is going to start to impact us very soon. We have to slow down this developmental, this development that they're on. Yes, development is good, but it should be done in a way that it is controlled and that it will not hurt the environment or hurt the people. Plain and simple, everything they do they try to find some loophole to get the Department of Environment out to get them that they can't make a decision. We have to control this. This is why I'm standing strong. Nothing on the head of Barkas. If we have to buy it back, we have to buy it back. They did it for South Sound. If it's good for those folks up there, it should be good for us in West Bay. West Bears are just as good as anybody else in West Bay North. Nothing on the head of Barkas. That is something that must be preserved for us. Not just one little piece This is a national park. No, the whole head should be preserved and not touched in any way or form. Buy it back. Very plain and simple. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question, please. We have talked for many years in this country about how we would roll out a, a national program to replace all of our cesspools. One of the things that no one in this country seems to want to talk about is the fact that we develop and how we build does not have the type of responsibility we need to have. We flush our toilets and we pray and we hope that it's all going to work out in the end. There's a lot of work been done on the dump and yes, we are hopefully going to have a waste energy facility in place. But at the end of the day, until we roll out a, a, a national program to ensure that we tie all of our sewage and treat it properly, we are building a problem that our children and grandchildren are going to face down the road in this country. What is going to be left of our fisheries? We have a water table. We have a water lens. It's all interconnected. It is a hidden problem. That we all just close our eyes and we hope and pray that it's going to go away. But the, roost, the roosters are going to come home to crow in about 50 years in this country. We need to have a national sewer program and build out the network in this country. In regards to ensuring that we preserve the center of mangrove wetlands and Barkers has the feature in the next government. How we go about it? is going to be down to finances and how we're going to balance everything that all the competing priorities. The fact of the matter is we need to have the central mangrove wetlands enhanced in terms of our purchasing and enhanced purchasing embarkers because those are two pristine environments that have to be protected in this country. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, starting with you again, public safety. Are you satisfied with the level of policing and public safety in the District of West Bay? What improvements, if any, would you advocate if elected? I would, I would say that I, am, I continue to, to not be impressed with the policing model that we have in our country generally, and it's applied to West Bay North. 
this is not just a West Bay North problem. This is a national problem. I do, I believe that the policing model needs to change, that we have to be tougher on drugs, the drug trade, and drug trafficking and sale in this country. We have to shut it down. We have to ensure that we do everything we can to combat the trade of illicit drugs in our community. In regards to more general policing, yes, we need to build out our safety officer program along with our community policing. We've talked for so long about police being trusted partners. The fact of the matter is, Caymanians generally don't trust the police force. That's a sad state of affairs. You cannot have effective policing. You cannot have effective crime being combated if the community that the police are looking to police doesn't trust them, doesn't see them as partners. And so what we should have are substations in every area of our islands. We should have that in any area. Use the Japanese model. If crime spikes, you put a, a mobile police substation in there so that police can engage and win over the public and effectively help to keep crime low. Now, we are blessed in Cayman that we have one of the lowest crime rates. But in terms of our individual communities, I believe I can fairly say that Caymanians do not generally feel very happy about our policing model, outcomes, and the trust simply is not there. Thank you. Mr. Bush? There is a lot of improvement to make in the policing of our country. And it's not necessarily just West Bay North. It's all over. For some reason, in the last four or five years, policemen walking seems to be a problem. Even if they park their car, I'm going to use a district in West Bay North, even if they park their cars by Papagallo and walk down Powery Road and just did a foot patrol walk, see the people, this is how you build relationships. I remember both of them are retired now. I know Sarge is. I'm not so sure about the lady. Just walking into my yard and getting breadfruits. This is what the police used to do. Why we've moved from that? Yes, I see them driving. But even then, people complain, oh, the windows are down, windows are down on the cars. When they do do something different, I remember... A young man had just come back from university in England with a law degree, couldn't get a job, and he was out in his yard working out every day. And he happened to say to me, Coach, two days in a row, a policeman has driven by and waved to me, and, I, and his window was down. He described who it, how the man had looked, and with the two stripes on his shoulder, right away I knew who it was. It was Neblet at West Bay Station. This is what we need. People building a relationship with the people. You are there to serve us, not be adversarial. I have seen a young policeman take a spliff out of someone's hand, crush it on the ground. I said, why did you do that? He said, the paperwork and the sense and messing up his life for one spliff does, isn't worth it. And if I just do it that way, maybe he'll realize that we don't want to put him in jail. That's common sense, using, trying to build a relationship. And that's what we're lacking. The police have to get into a relationship while they're not, where they're not considered as a rival or they are trying to put us in jail on purpose or just out there to give us a ticket. We must change the way we think about this. Thank you. Mr. Bush, <clears throat> staying with you, uh, moving on to the subject of economic diversification. Financial services continues to come under external pressures and tourism may never return to pre-pandemic levels. So what are your views about diversifying the economy and which areas would you support and encourage? One of the areas that I think is very important for us to look at is agriculture. Why? Food security. What happened the other day during this pandemic when we saw some of our equipment being held up in the U.S., that was, that should have given us a little bit of a warning. 
if the U.S. had gotten in such a bad condition they decided they were not going to let food come out, where were we? We have to look at, we have to look at the agriculture field. It's just one area I'm going to give you in. And I remember one of my associates talking about it, and what we said was a good one to start to do research on was milk. We had it here before. Mr. Johnny Bothwell used to do it when I was a little kid. We have to think about maybe, okay, we'll just bring the cost of milk down because the shipping, the long shortness of life, all these things is what they use uh, as an excuse why it's so expensive even though it's duty-free. Well, let us look, try it on a small scale first, help somebody who's willing to do it, and let us see if we can do it. That's on the diary side. And there are many spin-offs on that as well. We already know and see what the farmers are doing. If we get these people doing these things, what we have to do to make it easier and profitable for them, when you want to bring in something that's going to compete, well, guess what? You're going to get duty on it. And you're going to make sure that the duty is a little high, that you will buy the local stuff. Look, I remember people used to complain that the local meat can't stay on the shelves. So it shows you, if you do local, People will buy it because we know it is much more healthy than what we get from overseas. But agriculture is one of the fields we can look at to diversify and let us see if what we can do to supply our own and how food security is very important for our future. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question. please. Firstly, diversification of the economy has to generate foreign exchange. We're 60,000 people. If we cannot generate foreign exchange, we cannot create a pillar. And so one of the ways that we have to do that is support the continued expansion of medical tourism. Medical tourism is real. This isn't just a, a fairy tale. There are many countries in this world that are benefiting greatly from medical tourism. And we in the Cayman Islands can do so as well. We've seen the direct benefits that Health City has, in fact, I think I've had more constituents tell me that they're up at Health City to tell me that they're at Georgetown Hospital at present. And so not only do you create the possibility for foreign direct investment and foreign exchange, the way in which the country can make money, that's how you build another pillar for the economy. Now, Mr. Bush has mentioned some other initiatives that we should be able to push. And I would agree with him on pushing food security. And, I would, and, and those sorts of other things in this domestic economy that helps to protect what we do here and ensure we're more um, insulated from the outside. But to ensure that we can build another pillar, I can say that we have to go down the road of medical tourism, sports tourism. Those can be two big anchors for us, big anchors that, can, that allow us to make the foreign exchange that we need as a government that then allow us to build out other programming, things like green initiatives, things like agriculture and food security. Those come after you build a third leg to this economy. Thank you. Thing with you, Mr. Anglin. This question is around youth. What do you regard as the top two issues facing our youth of today, and how do you intend to address these concerns if elected? Top, unemployment. The rate of unemployment of Caymanians under 24, unacceptable. Cayman is for Caymanians. We're building this country for our young people. Those of us that are almost 50 and over 50, we're on the other side, the other side of the lifespan that God has given us. And so it has to be about building for the future. We have to ensure that the programming at SIFAC, which I started, is expanded. We have to ensure that we have a true national apprenticeship training program where every Caymanian child who does not go on to sixth form and university are given the skills that they need to build a good life and to be a part of a vibrant middle class in this country. That is what is going to be the hope for the next generation of Caymanians, so that we can, we can stop this trend of hearing Caymanians genuinely say, who are we building for? 
That is a very, very dangerous thing when people in a community, especially this size, with 22,000 work permits and having granted more than 20,000 status, statuses in the last decade plus, it's a very, very bad social env um, environment for people to have to survive and live in. The second thing is ensuring that we continue to build out the programming that's available to all of our young people to maximize their potential in all set fields and sectors, which includes uh, sports, the arts. We, we have a lot, let's be honest, but we have a long ways to go to ensure that persons who are talented in those sectors continue to get enhanced support. But the first thing we have to tackle, youth unemployment, ensuring that we're providing the programming that all of our Caymanian young people can take up their rightful place in society. Thank you. Mr. Bush? Thank you. The young people are almost to a place where they're giving up. They've been told, go to school, get your degree, then they come back and they can't hold a job. They can't get a job. No matter what, it seems that every obstacle is thrown in their way. This, everyone knows about this, but no one seems to want to grab it by the horn. It has gotten to a place where a lot of young people are now having mental issues. When we say mental issues, we're talking about depression. They're, they're getting, uh, they're upset about things. They're snapping off because they don't see a future in their own country. This is not right. We have to ensure that these people, young people, when they come back, are guaranteed. This, in our time, you went off on a scholarship, you came back, you worked. People gave you a scholarship, they hired you when you came back. When you came home, you had work experience during the summer. And then we look at the lower spectrum of the younger people that are still in school, high school or primary school. And believe you me when I say there are problems there. But that, a lot of that stems from the home. We have to help the parents be parents. Some of these are so young. We have to admit the fact that we have a lot of young parents. When I was the president of the PTA, and I have one of the former members sitting here, we had started parenting to parenting workshops. And this was in the early 90s. We identified this problem. Working with parents and how to be better parents. This is something that we have to do. When you do this, you'll help the children in return. Young people, children are coming to school, no breakfast, no lunch. Luckily, we've identified this. And we're trying to feed them. But these are just some of the problems. But our youth have a lot on their plate right now, and we have to jump in and look about it very quickly. It's a, something that must be a priority. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bush, staying with you for the last question in this particular round. Uh, focusing on benefits reform. Pensions and health insurance reform are top issues being discussed by many candidates during this year's election campaigns. What is your position on this subject and what reforms would you support if elected? Well, we already knew that the... You, uh, let me make sure I get this thing right. Issues being discussed. Insurance reform, there it must be universal insurance. For too long, the insurance companies are getting people when they come on work permits. They're healthy, they have to pass. If they don't pass a, a medical, they're not given a work permit. So these people are healthy. These people are coming on to the insurance companies where they don't have to go to the doctors that often. Caymanians are there with their companies. Everything is good. As they get to a stage where they get older, they retire, all of a sudden they're dumped on cynical. It cannot go on that way. So maybe it's time, as we know, what about insurance is all about spreading the, the cost across the board. So maybe it's time for us to go to one insurance, maybe two. But uh, universal insurance must be looked at. It must be discussed because we cannot continue the way we're going with cynical. And taking people who have been with the insurance companies for 30 years, not a bit of problem, all of a sudden they're dumped on us. So maybe it's time for us to grab the bulls by the horn and say, guess what? We're going to do insurance. You come off the plane, you're working a work permit, 
Care is a program, $200 a month. It covers everything. And it is time for us to reinstate free medical for young children the way it was 20 years ago. Why this was taken out, no one can give me a reason why. Also, free medical for our elders. Plain and simple, no red tape, no discussion. You go in, your file is there, they take care of you. It's the only how we're going to make sure that uh, we help uh, everyone. We have to protect them from themselves, and we're going to, in the long run, it will benefit the country that we don't have to keep dumping millions of dollars into Seneca every year without anything coming in to help cover some of the costs. So I think we have to go to universal coverage for all. Thank you. Mr. Anglin. Firstly, in regards to pension reform, for a long time, we have kicked this rock down the road. I say rock, not can, because when you kick a can, you don't, you don't feel much pain. When you kick a rock, you do. And, and we've seen what happened with COVID, and we've seen the over $400 million that have been taken out. The chickens are going to come home to roost in that one too. And so we need to ensure as a country that the rate, the rate that has to be, has to be contributed for pensions, has to be realistic about how people will retire. If we don't, we're going to continue having people reach the age of retirement and you have to go to NAU to augment yourself, to sustain yourself. In regards to health and health insurance, the provision of basic health care has been something that we have not settled a specific policy on firm enough, in my opinion. Yes, the hospital does a good job. Yes, there is interconnections between the hospitals, Seneca and NAU. But the problem is too many residents are falling between the proverbial cracks. I believe that in our next wave of health insurance reform, we have to sit with health insurance companies. We have to ensure that pre-existing conditions and the rates that they actually charge are fair. And we have to ensure that the contribution that all of us who are healthy make to the uninsured program is augmented. Someone has to pay. Someone has to pay and it's going to be all of us. It depends on what model we decide that we're going to utilize. I'd like to thank the candidates. We've gone through 15 questions. So when we come back, the final round of questions and then closing statements. Please stay tuned.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for West Bay North. And I'll turn it over to Joanne for the next and final round of questions. Mr. Anglin, we'll start with you. Where um, the question is focused around Barker's future, which I know you both have touched on. Barker's is in the constituency of West Bay North. What is your view about the future development or preservation of this valuable natural resource and treasure? As we know, uh, I was proud to be part of a government that started what is a fledgling national park system. We know we don't have any proper national park system in Cayman up until this day. And so the government, the future governments, must ensure that we acquire as much property as possible in the Barkers area to preserve for future generations. Barkers isn't just um, for me, a political football. Um, I have so many pictures and treasured memories of riding that entire network with my girls. Um, that network of, of um, dike roads that lead to the head of Barkas. That is something that I cherish and I want to ensure we preserve for all future generations. As it relates to the coastline land, there are, there are number of people and entities that own coastline property in Barkas. My view is very, very simple. If government can't acquire property that is there, if it's cost prohibitive, we need to ensure that we treat Barkas very differently than Seven Mile Beach. We've, we've made enough mistakes in our development of these islands. And to my mind, the whole high water mark system that we have, where the setback is currently 130 feet from the high water mark and at Seven Mile Beach. We need to ensure that we increase that. I would say triple it. I would say set any development that would be proposed back at a minimum of 400 feet from the ocean front line, which creates, which creates a prescriptive right over that property for the public. And so when you have a prescriptive right at that level, you can be a lot less concerned about what a private individual may want to do on that private piece of property. Thank you. I understand that acquisition is important, but the price we have to look at. Thank you. Mr. Bush? This is going to be a very short answer. If acquisition is expensive, we know the budget for the government is not limitless. But then guess what? We can rezone it. But no building at all. Nothing up on the head of Barkas from the time you pass Papagallo. That's my stance on this. Not to be touched in any way or form. Simple. Thank you very much. Thank you. Staying on a somewhat similar topic, um, Mr. Bush, with you, subject of sustainable development. How would you define sustainable development and would you support the development of a national plan for the Cayman Islands similar to Vision 2008 if elected? Definitely. Sustainable, sustainable development is development that takes into consideration what's going to be done to the other entities around it. Yes, I agree with sustainable development. I've been saying it all night. We've gone into all this development and it's starting to affect us. They're taking up mangroves. They're uh, damaging the water table. They've gone way overboard. And I do feel that it is time for us to make the big plan, like you said, with uh, Vision 2000. If we have to do the same thing, we do it. But sustainable development is where we have to go. We have to protect what we have left for my grandchildren, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren. It's high time that we stop making these special interest groups, tell governments what they're doing, and we just go along saying, yes, yes, yes. It has to stop. It is time for us to take this very serious, grab the bulls by the horn and say, enough is enough. We're going to do this. We're going to do it properly, and we're going to do it in a timely manner that everyone can benefit, not just a few. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, same question. The National Development Plan has been under review. It's gone under review, I think, on about four different, 
expectations in the last couple of decades, and we've come to the same conclusion, art. There's an old saying, art from art equals art. And that's where we've gotten to with a national development plan. We have to ensure that the process that we have to follow, which is with the district meetings and consultation, is a part of whatever we do to ensure we create a sustainable national development plan for Cayman. But we also have to look at every district, every area of Cayman, and ensure we allocate the correct amount of land for differing purposes. Just yesterday, I had a resident of West Bay North call me and say, if I get elected, would I consider, would I consider ensuring that there's some light commercial, light industrial in West Bay North? Because simply put, the plans he has, he's going to have to take them to another part of the island outside the district of West Bay because nothing is left in the district of West Bay. And so it has to be a holistic plan that truly takes into account the 22 miles that we have. It also has to take into account central mangrove wetlands, what's going to be the future, east-west arterial road, how is it going to be built, and how is it sustainable for us. But most importantly, getting back to Barkas, right now, just past Papagallo, there's a, there's a home already built. I think it's over 6,000 square feet. So the plan to not have any development beyond, Bar- beyond Papagallo that's gone out the window. There's already a huge house. I saw it just today. I welcome all West Bay North residents to go and really see what's happening in Barkas. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, staying with you, um, another topic which you both have discussed this evening is affordable housing. What strategies would you support or propose to ensure that there is affordable housing for residents in West Bay? Well, I'll, I'll elaborate on my plan a little bit more. And let me just first say, this socialistic approach that a number of people in this country seem to believe is going to ha- solve prob- housing ought to look at the results for the last 30 years. The National Housing Development Trust has a role in the Cayman Islands. In my opinion, their role should be for any residents who absolutely <coughs> positively cannot qualify for any program government puts in place and try to try and stabilize the rental market, especially for families in transition. That is persons who have been unemployed, persons who are in need and dire need of housing under NAU. But let's deal with the thousands in the middle. Right now, if you go to realtors, they reckon there's over a thousand Caymanians who right now are in search of adequate housing. The majority of them are actually approved at the bank. But they simply cannot find either a standalone house or a unit in that 1,000 to 1,500 square foot range in the price range somewhere between 250 to 300,000 because the housing just simply doesn't exist. And so when we look at good Caymanian developments, like developers like Arden Rivers, Aramando Ebanks, Junior and Ray Hides, those aren't big developers, but they're Caymanians who are doing a lot of good development. Government needs to work with developers like them and go to them with the equity injection program that I'm proposing. Waive all of their fees and reallocate that waiver into direct equity for Caymanian homeowners. The market can greatly assist in solving the housing crisis and we leave the Housing and Development Trust to then deal with stabilizing the rental market and those who don't even reach that threshold. Thank you, Mr. Bush. As we know, when you go to the National Housing Trust and you have to qualify for these homes that the governments have been building, the question that keeps coming up from people, they're saying, look, I am paying $800 a month rent. I'm paying $900 a month rent. Why can't I do that own one of these government homes? Because I make $3,000 a month, they tell me that I don't qualify. We have to simply make sure that everybody has access to one of these homes. Now, we do not want people using it as a money-making 
try to use it because you always have some people try to mess up things for everybody else. And we have to make sure that if you buy one, you just can't turn it around right away and say, I'm going to make a profit on it and go on to something else. No, we have to identify tracks to land. I must say that uh, I understand the government has acquired more land again. We have to go out and acquire more land because there are more young people who, who are coming or getting, who if they get jobs, they would be more than happy to pay $800, $700 a month. This is something that they can afford. And we, the National Housing Trust, I must say, just like NAU, just like work, they're working with their hands tied and people complain, but they are trying their best with what they're being given and what they have to work with. But we must look at these homes for everyone. Yes, the one, people at the bottom end need these houses more than anyone else, but there are also people, like I said, in that bracket, when you say, oh, I'm making $3,000 a month, so I don't qualify. Well, we have to make it easy for everyone to stand a chance at one of these homes. Our people should get a piece of this Keman pie. It's time for Keman to be about Kemanians. It's time for us to stop, stop being in the back of everything. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bush, staying with you, uh, moving on to the topic of transportation. Uh, in light of the significant development projects that are underway or have been approved around Grand Cayman, what additional changes to roads and public transport systems would you like to see above the current road improvements already announced? Also, do you support placing a limit or restrictions on vehicles imported? Yes, I do agree with the amount of cars that are being imported should be curtailed. How many cars uh, one family can have, uh, people who want work permits, how many cars they can have, and you actually go on to a place where I know people who are here working on work permits, bringing seven, eight, nine cars a, a year to sell. They've got it at a business and they pay no license. So it, we have to do something. We have to put up a serious transportation system that runs on a time frame where you know the bus will be at this spot at 10 past five and it will leave there at 15 past five. Not the way it is when you see three or four or five buses right behind each other, each out racing and overtaking each other to try to get uh, customers. If we do this, if we carpool, all these things can help solve this problem. We are very fortunate right now with the liens coming out and going into West Bay that we don't have what's happening on the eastern side of the island. We are very fortunate and we are God blessed. And at plenty of times I shake our, uh, Mr. McLean's hand from East End and tell him thanks very much. And it is something that we have to take very serious and we have to say, look, this is the way it's going to be. If you want a bus license, you obey these rules. That is one of the ways. And yes, we have to curb the amount of cars that's in this country. Very simple. Thank you. Mr. Anglin. So I can remember coming home from university in 1995 and traffic being backed up past the four-way stop, past the Northwest Point Road juncture, and well into West Bay. So the fact of the matter is, residents on the eastern end, we feel your pain. We knew your pain. There's no doubt we have to build the east-west arterial road. That is a given. However, there are two other key, key public policies that we can't kick around and not be very specific about. Firstly, the current transportation network of the min of minibuses are in the hands of Caymanians. Caymanians own the routes. Now they hire drivers and lease them out. And so the real political decision is, is government going to stand up to its own people and say, listen, you own these and you're making a living off them. It's not good enough. To my mind, you put everyone in a cooperative. If you, if let's just say there's a hundred routes in Cayman and you own 10, if you own 10, you own 10% of the cooperative. You replace all of these inefficient minibuses with a properly timed and structured system with adequate buses that can hold people in comfort. And you have a route that, and, and therefore, if everyone's in a cooperative, they make 
their money, they make their profit. Schools. All private schools have got to have a mandate come down from central government that busing is going to be the order of the day. If in the summers, there's little to no traffic, but once school is in, we don't have to be rocket scientists to understand schools impact traffic. And they sent a survey out. There's no time for surveys. We know what the answer is, and we're going to have to do it. These are political decisions that need to be made in this country if we're going to curb the, 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 the traffic issues that we face. Thank you. This is our last question. Mr. Anglin, we'll start with you. This is about coalition government. Many candidates in this year's election have identified themselves as independent. If elected, would you be prepared to join a coalition group, party? If yes, which of the declared political groupings would you be willing to align yourself? So, yes, we have a political mess. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, and the same thing happened in 2000 when I was elected. And, and I saw what happened to the negotiations then. I saw what happened in the negotiations in 2017. I am running for the district of we the electoral district of West Bay North. Whoever gets elected in the other electoral districts are going to be the persons who are there, put there by the will of the people. I have no crystal glass. I, I, I have no idea who is going to get elected in those other districts. And so at this stage, I'm keeping all of my options open to work with whomever the people of the Cayman Islands put in Parliament and try to ensure we can put together the best possible government. I don't believe that there's any grouping that I can identify and look at and say there's a, there's a preferred group. At the end of the day, it's going to be the will of the people that decide who occupy all of those seats. The fact of the matter is, to ensure that we have the best government, what we all should be doing is running campaigns that are based on fact, not fiction, campaigns that are based on real public policies, and ensure that when we get elected, when you get elected, you march into Parliament and Cabinet and roll up your sleeves to work. We don't, we're not going to have time to have people take five, six months to figure out what they're doing. We were, we are on the heels of a global pandemic. We know we need a third pillar to this economy. We've discussed a range of important issues in this forum tonight. I'm work ready and I'm ready to work with whomever the people of this country elect. Thank you. Mr. Bush, same question. The grouping that I'm with is very obvious. If sat on my platform or sat on theirs. What I will say with this, and we will have to work with other people, I'm pretty sure of that. But what I do know is this I will not sit with certain people who do not have the same principles that I do. I will continue to work hard. It's something that I've done for over 40 years, so that's nothing new to me. But if someone uh, differ from my philosophies and so forth, I'm okay. That's their choice. That's their prerogative. I'm not going to sit and attack anyone for their beliefs or whatever, but I have certain principles that I stand for, and under no circumstances will I bend my principles. I know I can represent the people of West Bay North, and I will do a good job of it once again. Anything I've been asked to do, I've done, and I will continue to do that. So, we have not sat down and said, uh, who we're, oh, but this one or that one. It's a simple thing. Do you have the same principles that we do? And we'll take it from there. Thank you. I'd like to thank the candidates. We've gone through 20 questions, four rounds of questions. So, so thank you very much. So right now we're going to take a short commercial break. And when we return, each of the candidates will deliver their closing remarks. Please stay tuned.
thanks to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting us. I would like to say, send out condolences to the family of Paul Rivers as his aunt Naomi just passed away. And I'd like to say, extend from my family and to their family uh, my best wishes. Thanks again to the Chamber for hosting this forum and for giving us a platform to directly address the people of West Bay North and the people of the Cayman Islands. As I have said, elections have consequences and the will of the people will determine those consequences for the next four years. What I have to say directly to my people in West Bay North is this. If you want a rep who will talk less and do more, I am your man. For over 40 years, I have been active in our community. And not only in West Bay, but throughout the Cayman Islands, with regard to sports, youth development, Olympics, Special Olympics, Pirates Week, PTA, and many more, to name just a few. I have been at the forefront of working, especially with our young people. Because this represents not only our past, but our future. The future looks bleak because our borders have been closed. But we have our lives. We have a lot to be grateful for. We have been disciplined, and we have to be given credit for that. We need a government that will invest in us, the Kimanian people. We need a government that will put Kimanians first. We need a government that will turn the Kiman dream into a reality. We have to look at home ownership, decent pay, pay salaries, and enjoying a quality life. For the past four years, I have fought for all of these issues with the government looking, lacking the will to make changes to a system that is geared to their friends and the special interest groups. You have a clear choice. Myself, who is for you guys, and for your children, and for your elders. Thank you very much, and God bless. Mr. Ralston Anglin. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce, thank everyone of you, uh, thank you, Will, and the President and the Secretary. Uh, thank the listening audience for participating. Without an audience, what this would all be for naught. Thank my colleague on the panel for being here. Uh, I, too, would like to offer condolences to my fellow Northwest Point family, the Rivers family, and the family of Miss Fazio. I would like to end by offering a couple of very brief comments that are about representation. There is no heavier burden than a great opportunity. And the great opportunity is to represent the people of West Bay North. And I say this with great pride that Cayman has been built by people who deserve better. Cayman has been built in a way that has caused us to slightly lose our way for a lot of Caymanians. And so I shouldn't have to be up here saying that Cayman is for Caymanians. That's the way it should have been all along. But there are some great burdens to whoever gets elected in this upcoming election. There's the burden of employment, unemployment of our youth, the burden of a housing crisis, the burden of a health care system that is in crisis, the burden of public education reform, the burden of adult training and upward mobility, the burden of representing 
this country overseas. I'm a person who is ready to work, to ensure we rebuild our society, and build an economy that pays for all of the services that my opponent mentions that he's worked for. It is about who can provide the leadership to get there and the leadership to pay for it. We'll thank the candidates. Now I'd like to turn it over for closing remarks from President Mike Gibbs. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> On behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I'd like to thank our West Bay North candidates for participating in this evening's uh, forum. And I trust that the forum will help the voters in that constituency to determine who to vote for on April the 14th. I'd also like to thank Fosters for their major sponsorship of these uh, Chambers candidate forums, as well as Affinity Recruitment, Bodens Legal and Corporate, and DART. If you're interested in viewing more of the Growth Matters video series that have been playing during tonight's commercial breaks, they can be accessed at growthmatters.ky. Please join us tomorrow evening as we welcome Mario Ebanks from West Bay West. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you will join us tomorrow evening at the same time. Good night.